program, I was looking at how the coastline of northern England has become a wonderful place to go for fun and indeed frolics. Then I was exploring the remarkable group of buildings that were created to satisfy our love of the seaside. But there have been lots of other reasons for building on the coast. We built there to protect ourselves from invasion by people and by the sea, and we put up buildings which were meant to increase our wealth and power as a trading nation. And as you'll see, we have over the years produced some extraordinarily powerful seaside buildings. None more dramatic and impressive than the maritime buildings which line the banks of the Mersey at Liverpool. In my opinion, apart from London, Newcastle and Liverpool are the two most impressively situated cities in England, and in both cases, it's because of the river. Liverpool is the only city that you can look at more or less in its entirety from across a wide river. The Mersey is about three quarters of a mile wide here, and if you've got a view like that, it's your responsibility, in my opinion. <gasps> That's two opinions in one paragraph. It's your responsibility to make something of it, which is difficult when your city is built on an almost entirely flat site. Thank goodness, therefore, for the pierhead buildings, the three graces, as they seem to call them here, because of their big. How about that for a bit of architectural criticism? None of them are very old, but they are really big buildings. They were put up in Edwardian times at the beginning of the 20th century, when England really thought something of itself. And it's clear from these that Liverpool did too. They're confident and exciting, and though they were built within a few years of each other, they're surprisingly different. The smallest is the Cunard building. Just an ordinary old office block now, but built in those wonderfully romantic times when Cunard liners ruled the seas. Now that's not bad as a glorified ticket office, is it? One of the great sources of joy about architecture for me has always been the names of the people who design buildings. For example, it's never failed to give me childish satisfaction that the Tyne Bridge is designed by a firm called Kakit and Burns Dick. Well, the Cunard building was designed by a firm called Willink and Thickness. <laughs> How I would have loved to have met a pupil called Thickness in my teaching career, eh? But was not to be. The grandest of the three is the Mersey Dock and Harbour Board HQ. You'd call this style Edwardian Baroque, and this is a really, really grand example of the style. To a little lad born in Carlisle, and even one living in Newcastle now, this feels metropolitan. You could rule the world from a building like that. But if that's the grandest, the most impressive and the most unusual really is the Liver Building. You hear people from here banging on about it so much that I was determined not to be impressed by it when I got up close, but I am. It's massive, but it's original too. The design uses ideas from elsewhere in a very free and exciting way. It feels American to me, actually, and that seems appropriate here, where shipping and contacts with America have been one of the principal sources of wealth. Can you imagine anybody getting permission to put up buildings on this scale today? We'd run a mile. We're so scared of changing things that we seem to have lost the confidence to try out new things. Well, thank goodness they had more confidence in the past, because these three have defined the image of Liverpool for the past hundred years. You couldn't imagine the place without them. That wealth, that confidence was generated by shipping. For a long time in the 18th and the 19th century, Liverpool was among the richest and busiest ports, not just in Britain, but in the world. And that period has left us with some of the most remarkable seaside buildings to be found anywhere in the world. And I'm talking specifically docks and warehouses. <music> Liverpool has more docks than you've had hot flushes. The first enclosed dock in the world was built here in 1715, and since then there have been oh, loads built. 
A lot of them have been filled in and built over, but there are still masses of them. There's the Canning Dock and the Salt House Dock, the Waterloo Dock, the Salisbury Dock, the Canada Dock. Most of these docks were designed by one man, a remarkable architect and engineer called Jesse Hartley, who was Liverpool's dock engineer for 36 years, between 1824 and 1860. He was remarkable first of all because of the scale of operations that he was involved in. He quadrupled the area of docks in the city, I think he built 16 new docks, and he built this tremendous river wall. Now Liverpool needed the docks because of where it's built, on a tidal river. The tiny ships that they had in the distant past could tie up in the river or on the river bank, and when the tide went out they were just allowed to settle into the mud until it came back in again. But as ships got bigger and more numerous, that wasn't an option, so Hartley built this wall. 18 feet wide and 40 feet high and virtually indestructible. And that's the main reason why Hartley is so remarkable, because his buildings feel as if they could last forever. This is the Albert Dock, begun in 1841 and completed in 1845, right at the beginning of the Victorian period. It's his best. I think it's safe to say that it's the greatest dock in the world, surrounded by the greatest warehouses in the world. It's also great because it's got immense power. The masonry of the dock walls is done in massive blocks of granite, with pointing which is apparently just about as hard as the granite itself, and the scale is cyclopean, epic. You notice that the blocks aren't regular, they're all odd shapes, fitted together like jigsaws, like something from an Inca city. The warehouses also have an unparalleled solidity and dignity. They're five stories high, and they rest on short, stubby Greek Doric columns of tremendous strength and weight, and every now and then the plainness is relieved by an arch, an elliptical arch. Hartley designed everything here, and it's all in the same chunky, solid scale. There were capstans which were used to haul sailing ships into the dock. There were hydraulic lifts for unloading the ships. Hartley designed all of these, and all of the machinery that went in them. Elsewhere in the docks, it's Hartley's details which are so exciting. There are massive gate piers, for example, which are like giant chess pieces. They had ingenious mechanisms so that the doors could be concealed inside the piers. Extraordinary objects designed by an extraordinary mind. It might seem an odd thing to say about buildings which are so solid and so plain, but Jesse Hartley's dock buildings are enormously romantic. Their massiveness is sublime, and in my opinion, they're among the most memorable things in the whole of Britain. The sort of monumental architecture that Jesse Hartley was putting up at Liverpool to control the sea was going up all over the country in Victorian England. It was a heroic time for architecture and the North was at the forefront. In fact there's no better example of it than the piers built to protect the mouth of the Tyne, which are one of the wonders of the Victorian age. Before they were built there was a shallow bar across the mouth of the Tyne between North and South Shields. It was apparently shallow enough at low water for people to risk wading across, but it was also shallow enough to keep ships stranded in the Tyne for weeks on end. And that mattered, because the Tyne was a major port and certainly couldn't afford any slowing down of trade. It was worse than that though, because these waters were also lethally dangerous. These are called the Black Midden Rocks and they've been notorious for centuries. In 1864, the people of North Shields and Tynemouth had to watch helplessly while two ships sank just down here, right in front of them. But you know, this is another example of the sort of heroic attitudes that the Victorians took. When the locals saw how helpless they'd been, they immediately did something about it, and they founded the world's first volunteer life brigade. And then they built themselves a watch house. 
Now, this just happens to be one of my favourite buildings anywhere. From the outside, I think it's lovely, nice and pretty, and appropriately seasidey. The chaps here at the Tynemouth Volunteer Life Brigade have been involved with hundreds of rescues and done some wonderful work over the years. But one thing they're not good at is throwing things away. They've kept the lot. It's like the cupboard under our stairs. There are things here which are beautiful and things which are fascinating, but there are many things which are really, really touching. The barrels hanging up here all have a story to tell. The sailors of a Russian ship lashed themselves to these ones in an unsuccessful attempt to save themselves. This one saved a little girl, the five-year-old daughter of an English sea captain. Sadly, her mum and her dad both drowned. It's one thing to try and rescue those in danger, but it's no substitute to trying to get rid of the danger in the first place. So, in order to make the Tyne a safer place, they made the decision to build piers. Now, I don't know about you, but even today, piers seem to me to be almost impossible things to build. The sea is so nasty and cold and rough, so unpredictable and dangerous, that it doesn't surprise me in one jot that it took 50 years before the piers were finished. Bits of them kept on getting washed away, but the builders kept on going. Men kept on going down in diving bells for a generous extra two and sixpence a day. Here are a few of the original granite blocks still lying around unused, but as the century progressed, they gave up using limestone for the core of the building and turned to concrete instead. And here's one of the original massive concrete blocks still lying here after 120 years. And they kept on moving out. 2,900 feet for the North Pier, a massive 5,400 feet for the South Pier, which has got no headland to start from, which snakes out to sea in a series of elegant serpentine curves. Just your sets. My face is supposed to look this green. Intrepid as I am, I'm on my way to the Farn Islands off the Northumberland coast. There are 15 of them, I believe, or 28, depending on the state of the tide. They're made of a volcanic rock called dolerite, which sticks up all over Northumberland and provides some of the northeast's most dramatic landscapes. For example, from here I should be able to see three of the great coastal castles of Northumberland. Bamber is obvious there since it's so close, but up to the north you can see Lindisfarne, Holy Island to give it its alternative name, and down to the south, Dunstanbury. All of those are wonderfully exciting places, and all of them stand on outcrops of volcanic dolerite. And here we are, beneath the dolerite cliffs of the Farn Islands, which also give general satisfaction on the excitement front, in my opinion. I've come here to explore, in one last place, the ways that northerners have responded to the difficulties that the sea throws up. The northeast coast was always A, extremely busy as a shipping route, and B, extremely dangerous too. And there aren't many places which show our struggles against the sea better than here. Lighthouses, for example. There's only one major lighthouse on the northwest coast, and that's at St. Bees in Cumbria. But there are 13 on the east coast, and two of them are here on the farms. That's how dangerous it was. The history of lighthouses is interesting. 
They've existed at least since Roman times, and they, there could well have been lighthouses associated with Roman signal stations on our northern coast at places like Scarborough and Bamborough. There were a few built in medieval times, often by the church as an act of charity. The first regular one here on the Farns was a beacon, which was lit nightly from 1673, but the present ones were built by Trinity House in the early 19th century. Like almost all lighthouses, they're beautiful, because they're simple and elegant, knee frills, just perfectly suited to their job. Of the two on the Farns, the one on Inner Farn was built in 1809 and is quite small and very pretty. The other was built a little later in 1826 on the remotest of the islands. This is the Longstone Lighthouse, which was the home of Grace Darling. Now, if you don't know about Grace Darling, you should. And if you do, I'm sorry to be going on about her, but uh, she was the lighthouse keeper's daughter. And she was living here, which is in many respects a wonderful place. A bit disappointing, I suspect, if you're a young lass who likes to go clubbing. But uh, that was her room up there. The third one up, we're supposed to be in it now, except that it's too rough to get on shore. And it was from that room on the 7th of September, 1838, that she looked out and she saw the steamship Forthasher strike the big Harker rocks a mile away across mountainous seas. She raised the alarm and while the survivors clung desperately to the rocks, she and her father rode out to get them. She only made the one trip. Her dad and some of the sailors did the rest but her part in the rescue was irresistible. Young lass, she was only 23, big storm. It made her a national heroine. Not that it did her much good, because she died two years later of TB. A sad end to a good story, but isn't that the way of the world? And finally, since we're here on the Farns, there's one last story, one last group of buildings which show that our modern day delight in the seaside and our determination to control it hasn't always been the common response. In the distant past, one group of people at least came to the seaside for very different reasons indeed. As far as I know, nobody lived out here in prehistoric times and there's no evidence that the Romans ever came here. The first people to have come here to live seem to have been early Christian monks seeking a bit of solitude. And your main man was our favourite northeastern saint, St Cuthbert, who lived here in the 7th century and came back here to die in the year 687 AD. Cuthbert didn't come here because it was a nice place to live, but because it wasn't. According to his biographer, the Venerable Bede, Nobody before the Lord's servant Cuthbert had been able to live alone in this place without trouble because it was haunted by evil spirits. And that's why he'd come, of course, to test himself against hardship and the devil. And, of course, he won. He wouldn't have been a saint if he hadn't. According to Bede, he stuffed the devil and drove him out. What a man. There's nothing left on the island from Cuthbert's time except memories. But because of his fame, it became a place of pilgrimage after his death. And eventually, five or six hundred years later, there was a little monastery built here by monks from Durham. A very little monastery, just a couple of monks and a servant or two. But they still had two chapels facing each other across this little courtyard. It's not entirely clear why. Perhaps they had one each. This is my chapel. You go and play in your own chapel. Or maybe one of them was for pilgrims, or perhaps it was a relic from Anglo-Saxon times when it was quite common to have two chapels facing each other like this. But anyway, there's only one of them left now, and that's St Cuthbert's Chapel. It was built in 1370 and restored in the 1860s, and very lovely it is. It's all a lovely place, in fact, but it can't have been an easy place to live. Not only was it awash with devils, which can be unsettling if you're not used to them, but it was uncomfortable and even dangerous in lots of human ways. 
We were at war against Scotland, for example, and this was a very exposed spot. So eventually they had to build themselves a tower for protection against ye Scots. And then there's the weather and the sea, both of which can turn nasty up here at the drop of a hat. And yet, I can't believe that they wouldn't have loved it too, that they wouldn't have found it beautiful and awesome and spiritual. I hope they did. <laughs>